Karnadi gola kastang tach chabdadi graha kang kramat saukshmiat karyanu me yang tat prayodhaved bahir mukam. The five senses successively function through the external apparatus, the gross organs, the ears, the skin, the eyes, the tongue, and the nose. The senses are subtle. Their presence is to be inferred from their functions. They often move outwards. Compare Kata Upanishad 4.1. After describing the differences of the five elements according to their properties, the same according to their function is being shown. From the organs of perception, the senses are inferred. Text 8. Kadachit pihite karne shruyate shabda antaraha pranavayo jataragnao jalapane nabhakshane. But sometimes we hear the sounds made by our ingoing and outgoing breaths, and we hear buzzing sound when our ears are stopped. We feel an internal sensation of hot and cold when food and water are swallowed but they can also give rise to experience within the physical body. Text 9 Vyajante hyantara sparsha milane chantarang tamaha udgare rasagandhau chet yakshana mantara graha When our eyes are closed, we see inside the absence of light and in belching we experience taste and odor. Thus the sense organs give rise to experience of things within the physical body. Text 10 Panchokya danagamana visargananda kriya krishivanidhyasevadya panchasvantar bhavantihi the various actions of man can be classified into five groups, speech, grasping, movement, excretion, and enjoyment of sexual intercourse. Actions performed in agriculture, commerce, service, and so forth may be included into one or other of the groups. Text 11. Vakpani pada payupa styrakshaistat kriya janehi mukadi gola keshvaste tatkarmendriya panchakam. The five groups of actions are performed through the five organs of action the mouth, the hands, the feet, the anus, and the genitals. Indriyas are the senses. Golaka is the external apparatus situated generally on the periphery of the body. Namaste. So he mentions a shloka from the Kata Upanishad about the senses. Let's take a look at that. The self-existent Lord destroyed the outgoing senses. Therefore, one sees the outer things and not the inner self. A rare discriminating man desiring immortality turns his eyes away, and then sees the indwelling self. Paranchi, outgoing. By the word ghani, ka, meaning an orifice, cavity, are referred to the senses such as ear, etc., which are suggestively indicated by it. They surely proceed outward for revealing their objects, sound, etc. He, vyatrinat, afflicted, that is, killed these, since they are of such a nature. Who is he that did so? Svayambhu, the great Lord, who, Bhu, exists forever, and Svayam, by himself, on his own right, and not subject to anything else. Since he injured them, Tasmat, therefore, the perceiver, individual, Pashyati, sees, perceives, parak, the outer, sounds, etc., 
which are the non-self and exist as external things. Na antaratman, that is, na antaratmanam, but sees not the inner self. Though such is the nature of man, yet like reversing the current of a river, kahachitiraha, some rare discriminating man sees pratyagatmanam, the indwelling self. So this is the point here. According to Vedic wisdom, there are ten senses, five knowledge-acquiring senses and five action senses. All ten of these are directed outward towards the external world. And because of this, one tends to miss the existence of the indwelling self. But, as Vidyaranya points out, even the outward-going senses can be turned around and experience things within the body itself, such as seeing the absence of light, hearing the ringing in the ears, belching, and so forth. So, they are not restricted to going outwards. Why do they do that? Because the Lord injured them. He killed them, as is figuratively expressed in Katha Upanishad. He disabled those senses so that they show only the outward things by default. Why is that? Because he wants to experience himself as being. He wants to become many. And so the illusion that the one self has become many is propagated by these senses which are directed only outwards toward the world. So the task of the yogi, the meditator, is to turn these senses around and become aware of the inside of the body, first of all, the internal changes of the body. That's why in Hatha Yoga, we do all kinds of postures and we monitor the flow of the prana and so forth, which gives us a very good idea of what's happening inside the body and even in the subtle bodies, such as the pranamaya kosha, the manumaya kosha, etc. So this leads eventually, gradually, step by step, to realization of the inner self. He who is aware of the inputs of the senses. And this is the aim of self-realization. Because without consciousness, the senses are useless. Huh? It's just like a television turned on and going in an empty room. Nobody there to hear it or see it. But the television is going on and on, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's the same with the senses. If the senses are going in the body and there's no one to perceive them, so what? They're useless. Therefore, there must be an inner self, a conscious self, to perceive the inputs of all these senses. This is the inference that one must draw from the existence of the senses. Why is inference so important? Because the self can only be realized in the beginning by inference, by reason, by knowledge. Therefore, Brahma Vidya, the acquisition of knowledge about Brahman, is the first step in self-realization. This is shruti, hearing. Not just any old thing, but hearing from the Vedas, hearing from the self-realized beings, hearing from the masters, the teachers, the sages. That wisdom that leads to the ultimate knowledge, that knowledge knowing which there is nothing further to be known. Why is that? Because everything is derived from the self. 
Everything is created by Brahman. Brahman is, in one sense, the cause of everything. The desire of Brahman to become many, to be born, to exist as an individual, as many individuals, is the root cause of the creation of the world. So, because the nature of the cause exists in the effect, mainly because the cause is the substrate and the effect is the superimposition, the product, the result, the action created by the cause. So the nature of the cause inheres in the effect. And when we realize first path, that wonderful, amazing experience where Devi reveals the presence of consciousness within everything in the world, that overwhelming realization when one first glimpses the absolute Brahman within all, we realize that, well, actually, everything is derived from Brahman. <laughs> there is no other explanation for the existence of existence. Try to understand. Why is there anything at all? Why is there a world? Why is there life? Why is there consciousness? Why are there beings and galaxies and planets and all this stuff? Simply because of the self, because of consciousness. And that consciousness inheres in all of these creations in varying degrees. Yes, you know, like a rock isn't very conscious <laughs> or a lower animal. But then the higher animals begin to experience more and more symptoms of consciousness. And until then, mankind is the highest of all the animals. So only in the human beings, only in this form, is self-realization possible. Why is that? Because if all beings could become self-realized automatically, the creation would simply cease to exist. <laughs> there wouldn't be anyone to populate it. There wouldn't be anyone to create karma and these cycles of cause and effect that go on for millions of births and create the world, the manifest world, as we know it. So it's not possible for all beings to become self-realized. But it is certainly possible for the more intelligent humans. Therefore, the Vedas and their ancillary literatures, like the Upanishads, teach the nature of Brahman as pure, unconditioned self-awareness. Awareness of the self within oneself and within all. And this is the highest platform of enlightenment. Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.